<clears throat> thank you, Steve. And thank you, Steve, for the uh, invitation to appear here and for your remarkable organizing of this amazing conference. It's such an open-hearted, pure <laughs> endeavor. Good for you, man. Good for you. We need more like this. And thank all of you for coming, care enough about yourself uh, to spend a couple of days learning uh, the real truth about hell. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I applaud all of you. So the name of this talk is Vegan Nutrition Pure and Simple. Why in the world am I up here talking to you about this? Well, it all started 1981, 38 years ago. I was at Vancouver General Hospital, a noble institution, uh, where I was doing a residency in anesthesiology. I thought I was going to be an anesthesiologist, did three years of an anesthesia residency. And if you need proof, uh, this is what I looked like back then. And as you see, I have not changed a bit. <laughs> I love the anesthesia. This is not me, a friend of mine, but this is what I did. I was the guy up at the head of the table, uh, getting people through these remarkable procedures and feeling their life force in my hands, the, their pulse under my fingertips, their breathing in the respiratory bag. And anesthesia is a beautiful and noble craft. But it put me in the operating room, and day after day, I watched what surgeons did. And in the cardiovascular anesthesia room, I watched surgeons operate on hearts and blood vessels. And day after day, I would watch surgeons open up arteries, and from the artery walls, they would peel off this yellow, greasy gut called atherosclerosis. Here we are in the carotid arteries going up to the brain, and uh, if these arteries get clogged, people suffer strokes. Uh, here's the mechanism. Any possible to get the overhead lights down, or maybe you have to keep them up for the video, but it'd be nice. Uh, here you see a plaque, oops, sorry, here you see a plaque growing out of the, uh, of the side of the wall. The danger is that the plaque can tear open, uh, exposing the cholesterol underneath to the blood flow channel and uh, this can set off formation of a clot, and the clot will stop the blood flow moving downstream, and whatever tissue is downstream dependent upon this blood flow winds up short of blood and often dies. If this phenomenon happens up in the brain, person suffers a stroke. <clears throat> if it happens in the heart, uh, the person loses a chunk of heart muscle, and that's a heart attack. This is a common disease, number one cause of death in this country. Every 33 seconds, someone grabs their chest in this country and falls over with a heart attack. Every other one of them dies. If you do the mathematics uh, over a 24-hour period, every 33 seconds, that's over 2,000 people. That's a 9-11 disaster. Every 24 hours, 2,000 people go down uh, with cardiovascular deaths. Well, in the 1980s, it was becoming obvious what the cause of all this was, not just bad genes uh, and cigarette smoking had something to do with it, but it became very evident that when you eat a standard Western diet and you fill your belly up with bacon and eggs for breakfast and cheeseburgers for lunch and chicken for dinner and ice cream for dessert and pizzas for snack, uh, hour after hour, you're uh, turning your blood thick with fat and during this time, the fat injures the artery walls, uh, setting you up for atherosclerotic plaque formation. It layers out on your abdomen, making you obese. It changes hormone levels, setting you up for prostate cancer, breast cancer. Not a good thing to uh, keep your blood fatty all day. It's the main cause uh, of this artery clogging. Also, in 1981, as I'm looking into the operating uh, room, spectacle in these people's chests and arteries, uh, it's also becoming evident that if this fatty animal-based diet clogs people's uh, arteries up, uh, then a diet based on completely plant foods uh, leaves your blood nice and clear. And keeping your blood clear and clean like this day after day after day melts away these plaques. Uh, it's quite a remarkable finding, but we had clues. Even back in 1977, Dr. Frey Ellis uh, published this uh, report uh, that described a 65-year-old man with such severe clogged arteries that uh, he would get crushing chest pain every 10 steps. Uh, in January of 1964, he went on a plant-based diet. 
uh, his, his arteries started opening up, and six months later, uh, in, um, he was walking the, uh, uh, the hills in uh, the UK, and by August, he was uh, uh, climbing mountains in the Lake District. This is a reversible disease, and everyone has the ability to open up their arteries with a healthy diet. Well, <clears throat> this of course progressed to Dr. Esselstyn's classic studies where you get these dramatic pictures of an artery so clogged up that it looked like the rats had been eating away at the, the dye channel here. This, these are all um, plaques that are encroaching into the blood flow channel, giving the scallop uh, appearance. They should all look like this nice broad band up here. This should look like. Uh, this person went on a whole food plant-based diet, and 22 months later, um, this artery uh, turned into this artery, same artery, uh, but these plaques will melt away. Uh, every cardiologist who sees these pictures should say, stop the presses, how did you do this? Tell me the secret, doctor, but I've been amazed at their lack of response to this remarkable set of photos. Anyway, here I am, 1981, back in the cardiovascular operating room, and something didn't feel right. Here I am, giving anesthetics six, eight, ten hours at a time for these complex procedures, and the surgeons are sweating bullets trying to splice these tiny little veins onto different parts of these uh, ravaged arteries. But I knew that the patient would, would get through this terrible recovery with their chest split open, uh, and they would limp out of the hospital, and no one was going to say a word to them about what their disease was. And the truth is, and I knew, and I knew every surgeon who was operating knows, that even though these guys were working really hard to bypass a clogging of the coronary artery down in their heart somewhere, atherosclerosis is a total body disease. If you've got it in your coronary arteries, all your arteries have plaque. And you've got plaque up in the carotid arteries to your neck, you've got it in the renal arteries to your kidneys, you've got it in the iliac arteries down to your legs. It's a total body disease. And just pecking away and rearranging the plumbing up in the heart really is not curing this person's disease in the slightest. It may save him from a sudden death due to a heart attack, but it won't save him from the stroke, won't save him from the renal failure, won't save him from the blue leg if the person continues eating those cheeseburgers and pepperoni pizzas and heaven forbid their cardiologist or surgeon uh, should talk to them about what they're eating. Well, 1981, my dad was already showing signs of clogged arteries. He was already having chest pains, already having a blue leg. I clearly had the genes for this disease, and I knew very well that if I kept eating what these patients were eating, soon that body laying on that table with that striker saw going up the sternum was going to be me. And I saw these folks when they woke up. I thought, that really hurt. I didn't want that fate at all. So I'm getting clues from the operating room that, Clapper, you ought to clean up your diet. You ought to migrate to uh, Dr. Ellis's plant-based diet from that fellow in England. So I was getting the message from the operating room. But I was also receiving a similar message from a totally different quarter. As you heard, I went to medical school at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And during my fourth year, I did most of my rotations at big, bad old Cook County Hospital across the street. And, and on Saturday nights, instead of going out and booging with my friends, uh, I would go to the trauma unit at Cook County and I would help out as a fourth year medical student. Well, you spend Saturday nights in the trauma unit at Cook County Hospital in Chicago, you are going to see everything. You're going to see the worst what human beings do to each other. The shotgun blast at close range, the 38 caliber Saturday night specials, the machete chops, the violence in words, the sexual violence, the psychological violence. Come Sunday morning after a night shift, I would walk out of that trauma unit shaking at what I had seen. It would take me all day just to stop vibrating on the inside. And I was so moved by the effect of watching all this violence that I made a vow to myself as a 23-year-old medical student that I couldn't, I couldn't eliminate all the violence in the world, but I could at least eliminate the violence out of my own life, out of my own heart, out of my own words, my own actions. I really wanted to become a man of nonviolence. And there certainly is uh, a tradition of living a, a life of nonviolence. And so I started reading 
uh, the people who are knowledgeable in this subject. I read uh, Mahatma Gandhi, read the Indian saints, uh, on how to live a life of ahimsa, of nonviolence. Well, that was what I was incorporating into my life. And uh, here I found myself up in Vancouver, seven years later, as an anesthesia resident, trying to live a life of nonviolence. And one night, I'm out with a friend of mine at a restaurant, and I'm holding court and pontificating about how noble it is for me uh, to live a life of nonviolence. Uh, but I'm giving this discourse while polishing off a porterhouse steak. And my friend listened, and he looked at me with great compassion and said, yeah, that's all very well and good, Michael, but if you want to get the violence out of your life, you might want to start uh, with that piece of animal flesh on your plate, because in fulfilling your desire for the taste of flesh in your mouth, you are paying for the death of the animal and for the next one in line at the slaughterhouse. <laughs> Well, when I heard those words, all the old rationales jumped into my head. Well, the animal's dead already, and that's what they raised them for. And all the, the old rationales that we're all familiar with came to my head. But before I could get those words out of my lips, the little voice on my shoulder said, you know, he's right. He's right. And when I went up to pay for the steak dinner, I felt complicit in a crime. I, I did most of my growing up on my uncle's dairy farm in northern Wisconsin. I know the truth of what it takes to put meat on the table. I saw those cows who stopped giving milk shot in the head. I chopped the heads off chickens. I know the violence inherent in all meat and dairy products. And at that point, something began really changing in my heart. If I'm going to be a man of integrity and compassion, do I walk my talk? And from that point on, whenever I got the, I'd walk past a barbecue and smell something, uh, or I would uh, see a chocolate sundae and get a little tempted, the little voice would come to my mind because I knew the truth of Keep that milk flowing. You've got to take those calves away from the mother and, uh, and, you, and kill the mother and turn her into hamburger. It's the truth of daring. It's a violent, violent food. Uh, all animal flesh foods are violent. And I had to ask myself, Michael, are you really that hungry that you would pay for this suffering, for the death of the animal? And the answer is always no. You know, those, the animals are never not looking. My conscience is never not looking. And... Uh, if I'm going to be a man of integrity, I have to act in such a way. So I had no choice. Uh, I adopted a plant-based diet. I couldn't have a piece of animal flesh looking back on me at the table. Well, uh, I certainly started enjoying the food, but I really didn't know anything about the nutritional aspects of it. And I started getting concerned. This is all very nice, but I pushed past my concern because of the way my body responded. My body loved it, and within 12 weeks, a 20-pound spare tire of fat melted off my waist, my high blood pressure came down to normal, my high cholesterol came down to normal, and I felt great waking up in a nice, lean, light body. So I was getting a validation, yep, this is a good fuel mixture uh, to run through your body. Well, it didn't take long, <clears throat> till I started looking in my closet. I was raised in a Jewish household after World War II. I saw the pictures of the lampshades made out of the skins of the Jews and uh, the, the belts, uh, etc., made of the skins of the Jews, and I began looking at my own shoes and my own belt. And knowing where they came from, it started feeling ghoulish uh, to put these on my waist and on my feet. So uh, there were, I knew very well that, um, that there were substitutions to be had. My Nikes were not made of leather. Uh, so I went in the backyard and I dug a hole. And uh, when I dug the hole, I put my uh, shoes and my belt and my wallet in there and covered it up. And, <clears throat> and I, stepped, I filled up the hole, stepped back, and I apologized to the animals. If you don't know, you don't know. 
But once you know, you, I think you have an obligation to, uh, to recognize the totality of where these things come from.